As we study the civilizations of the past, as we stride across the centuries, as we dive into the depth of time, we marvel as we behold the zenith of their splendor and we are bereaved by the grandeur of their fall. Today's lucubrations put into comparison two of the greatest empires the world has ever seen. The Roman Empire, Imperium Romanum, cuius caput erat Roma, olim maxima mundi occidentalis urbs, and the second Chinese dynasty, the Han Empire. 各位好,我是Mate阿特龙,今天我们一起学中国的朝代蛇,汉朝是中国历史,地质时代第二个王朝,在中国历史发展中占有独特而重要的地位。Roman Empire versus Chinese Empire. Well, putting together a comparative profile matrix is not an easy task, because for it to have any value which goes beyond mere speculation, we need to focus our research on the organizational, military, economic and political data, which in the case of these two empires is already a veritable cornucopia. Simply put, there is no military without economy, which in itself is a social domain that requires an established network of production, consumption and trade. Also, logistics will have to be taken into consideration, mainly Maintaining army supply lines while disrupting those of the enemy will be a key factor, since an armed force without resources is doomed. And last but not least, the information we have on how these two empires fought foreign powers will be presented. Once we have done this, we will dive into the spectrum of variables and draw our conclusions. One of the things that I like doing the most when talking about Chinese dynasties is to start by placing them temporarily. Now today we're talking about the Han Dynasty. And the Han Dynasty, it starts in 202 BC. That's when the dynasty was rising to power and it will last all the way up to 9 AD. This first section of the Han Dynasty is called the Western Han. So whenever you hear uh, people talking about the Western Han Dynasty, they're talking about a dynasty that was rising to power and was in control of China from 202 BC all the way up to 9 AD. So what happens in 9 AD then? Well, in 9 AD, we have another very small, very brief intermediary dynasty called Xin, or in Chinese, Xin Chao. But this will only last from 9 AD to 23 AD. And in 25, the Han Dynasty comes back. And we have the Eastern Han Dynasty from 25 AD to 220. AD. So the very small Xin dynasty can be considered to be an interregnum, if you will. Now to give you a little bit of historical context, before the Han dynasty we have got the Qin dynasty or Qin Chao, which is the first imperial dynasty in China, and after the Han dynasty will fall apart we will have the Three Kingdoms period. So the first question is, where was the capital in China during the time of the Han Dynasty? Because we do know that in modern day, the capital of China is Beijing, which literally translated from the actual Chinese characters, the Hanzi, and means northern capital. But at the time, the capital was Chang'an. Now Chang'an means, Chang means long, literally, and An means peace, so we can translate it as long peace, or as some people have translated it, perpetual peace. Very beautiful translation, but personally I prefer the literal one in this case. Uh, the character means long, and it's the same character that we find in the uh, Chinese word for great wall, which is Changcheng, and it means again long wall. So that would be the modern day Si An, so western peace, and it's a very famous city because it's where the famous army of terracotta warriors uh, produced for the first emperor of China, Qin Shi Huangdi, are. So a lot of people, if you're familiar with those, well that's the city. It just changed its name. But what's interesting for our study, considering the fact that we are um, speculating over a potential clash between the uh, Roman Empire and the Chinese Empire, but what's interesting is that this city was found in central western China, and that is a very interesting thing. The point of nevralgic power of the ancient Chinese Empire was closer to their potential enemy. 
The Han dynasty divided its territory into areas directly controlled by the central government uh, using a system inherited from the Qin Empire which was called the system of commanderies and also by utilizing semi-autonomous kingdoms. Now when addressing the Roman Empire I'm going to give a lot of information for granted because I've already covered the Roman Empire and the late Republic on this channel in loads of videos. So if you do not know much of the organization of the Roman Empire then please check out the links you will find in the description below. So pause this video and go check out those videos so that you can have a full overall understanding of how the Roman legions were organized at the time when the Han Dynasty was in power. Now, if you, of course, if you do understand that already, then let's proceed. But on this video, I will now focus on two things. We will compare the figure of the Roman Emperor and what changes when compared to the Chinese Emperor. Because in English, we use the same term. They're both emperors, but the Roman Imperator or the Roman Princeps were very different from the Chinese Huangdi or Tianzi. And we will see why. The Han period was a period of cultural impact and advances. We have the invention of paper, the seismoscope, the water wheel and many other forms of complex structural engineering. The economy prospered. So in this period we have a long-term treasury. And when we say long-term we mean that the same coinage that was used during Han rule will be used all the way up to Tang Dynasty in 618. Also we have the first nationalization of salt and iron industries, which happened in the early 160 BC. Now in terms of our clash, this means that the Han Empire was a very well established and economically secure empire that could afford to fully equip, train and maintain its forces. This is very important because we do know that the Roman Empire was extremely economically sound and successful. So in other words, we can say that any empire or kingdom that did not have a economy comparable to that of the Romans couldn't stand long warfare. The Han Dynasty, no problem. Now, logistics is a very important sector or section of military science. It is very important because you can have the best equipped, most professional army at your command. If you cannot supply them with food, new equipment, new materials, while the enemy can, eventually your army will be defeated. So logistics really has to do with the way you manage, move and place resources. It is a way to ensure an easily supportable system with a robust reliability availability, maintainability. Now we know that the Romans excelled in logistics. The ability to create supply chains was unparalleled. What about Chinese or Han logistics? Well, one thing we need to understand is that there is a massive difference between the way an army was organized for the uh, Chinese Empire and the way armies were organized for the uh, Roman Empire. Well, first and foremost, remember that geographically speaking, the areas where these armies had to fight were completely different. You cannot even begin to imagine a comparison between the forests of Germania or even Britannia or even fighting the Gauls in their land and the logistics that you needed for that and then compare it to the sort of logistics that you needed for the Han Empire when it was mobilizing its armies towards the grasslands of the north or towards the deserts. It was a very different situation because in China the areas were vast and what that means is that you needed bigger armies and I'm talking about enormous massive expeditions. So when you consider for example the two armies that, that were mobilized during the reign of Han Wudi, both armies that were led during the Battle of Mo Bei Zhejian or the Battle of the Northern Desert in the Gobi Desert, we're talking about a mobilization of about 340,000 men. Two questions, how does that compare to Roman armies? How do you take care of logistics for such armies? Well, to answer the first question, the Roman army, well, when talking about legions, we know that that's the main unit, and of course legions, the size of the legions, the way they were organized will change depending on what era we're talking about. But since at this moment we're talking about the uh, in Roman Empire, well, in late Republic, 4,500 men was the norm, the post-Marian reforms, of course the organization was not manipular anymore, we're talking about cohorts. But as we move into the empire, an army of the Principate could easily reach 5,120 legionaries and that is citizen troops only. So of course to that you need to pair almost an equal number of auxiliary troops. So we're talking about about 11,000 men for one legion. Now we know that at the 
peak of its power during the Pax Romana, Roman commanders could count on 30 legions. So if you do the numbers, yes, they could assemble an army of a similar size to the sort of army that the Han dynasty was organizing, but the only thing is that that would mean using and combining a huge amount of Roman consular legions, imperial legions. Uh, my opinion is that they probably wouldn't. I mean, you wouldn't really see the Romans using, taking every single legion that they have and just chuck it inside China. Uh, they would still have to take care of the Germans, they would still have to take care of local organization, because remember, Roman legions were also taking care of police scenarios, but that wouldn't really be too much of a problem for the Romans. They could still mobilize a big army, maybe not as big as that army that the Han dynasty would mobilize, but we know that the Romans did make that work all the time. They fought numerically superior enemies and they still won. How did they manage logistics? Well, it was harder. It wasn't as easy to take care of logistics for the Chinese as it was for the Romans. We know that the Romans excelled. They were spectacularly good at uh, taking care of logistics within the army, but also the Chinese did manage to do quite a lot of impressive things. One of the basic things when we consider uh, Chinese logistics of this time is the usage of wagons, carts, logistical carts if you will, creating these lines of movable supply centers that could be filled using outposts. So the idea of building outposts using an infrastructure of roads was a possibility. But roads alone couldn't cut it, not for the Chinese armies. Now here is something very interesting and ingenious that the Han emperors did in order to sort of share the burden of supplying the armies with everything they needed in order to be self-sufficient. And that is, they promised rewards in the form of nobility titles to all those who would have joined in and started taking care of the production and the moving of the sort of supplies that the armies needed. So uh, what sort of people would do this? Well of course the wealthy and uh, most of the times the wealthy were the merchants. Uh, now, the, re the question is, why would they do it? Why would it be so important to get an ability to title? Did it give them any political power? No, no political stray. It wasn't a sort of title that would really give you anything. But the re there are still two reasons why these merchants wanted it. Well, reason number one, remember, we are within Confucian society, and in a Confucian perspective, you, the uh, entirety of, of the population is divided into social classes. And yes, the upper echelon is the nobles, is the military, but still peasants are very high. Why? Because they produce something, they produce rice, they produce goods, but the merchants are pretty low. Not the lowest, because you still, have, you still have outlaws, you still have criminals, but they're still very low in the social scale because they're not producing anything. Most of the times merchants just buy and sell goods uh, that someone else produced for their own profit. So if you had a title, if you were a merchant, a rich merchant with a title because you had helped uh, supply the army, then that was a good way to sort of go up uh, within the scale of uh, Confucian society and therefore a lot of people did. But the second reason is a legal reason because let's say that you were a rich merchant but you broke the law, you committed a very serious crime. What would happen? Your head would be removed removed. But if you had a nobility title, then your nobility title would be removed instead. So using the Great Wall, thank you very much, Qin Shi Huangdi, was extremely important for them. Remember, and as my friend Roger, very good friend of mine, Chinese friend of mine, is very knowledgeable on this, and he has helped me in the production of this video, as he says, the Great Wall is not a border. It should not be understood as a border. What it is, it depends. When the empire is strong, then it acts as a base of operation. It's a base for power projection. When the empire is weak, it was a defensive line. One of the things that makes the Romans incredible, and I think in this case they would have an edge. In terms of logistics, purely logistics, they would have an edge in my opinion. And that is because building roads for the Romans, a walk in the park. The Roman legionary is not just a warrior, he's also a builder. They also use wagons drawn by oxen or mules. The legion was self-sufficient, self-sustaining. They were carrying with them livestock. They could produce their own food. They carried around smiths to repair their stuff. Basically the legion was a self-supporting microcosm. Also in terms of the ability of building outposts, well we know that the Romans could build castra. So both empires incredibly exceptional in terms of logistics, but I think the Romans would have the edge. The Chinese emperor, different from the Roman emperor, was somewhat of a mixture 
between a mystical figure, a political figure, and even a religious one. In a conversation with the emperor, it was considered a crime to compare oneself to the emperor. The level of respect that the Chinese had for their leader goes beyond anything that could be imagined. The emperor was the Huangdi. He was not to be addressed with as you, nor should his name be used. Huang Shang, Sheng Shang, Tianzi were all acceptable titles. But the one that I find most interesting from an anthropological and cultural point of view, the Son of Heaven, alluring to the celestial mandate that the Emperor was having, the sort of permission from the heavens to govern the people. He was for the people and his servants the Lord of ten thousand years. One sway year. The Roman Emperor was the ruler of the Empire during the Imperial period, so starting in 27 BC. But the Emperors also used a variety of different titles. So when we say Emperor in English, most of the time we are talking about the title Augustus or Caesar. But there are other possible titles, for example the one that the English word Emperor comes from. Imperator. Imperator is an interesting word because yes it was used but it's originally a military honorific title, a glorious title that was used and normally given to generals during their republic. Now this word will become to mean the emperor of the empire but mostly during the reign of Vespasian, meaning the ruler of the Roman Empire. But before that the early emperors mostly preferred to use another title, the word Princeps, plural principes. This means first, meaning first citizen of the state, because it implies primacy. This is why the usage of princeps and dominus broadly symbolize the differences in the empire's government, giving rise to the era designation principate and dominate. But one thing is for sure, the emperor was no monarch, he was not a king, in fact it was a figure in contrast with that of kings. Imperial succession itself, yes it was generally hereditary, but it was only hereditary if there was a suitable candidate acceptable to the army and the bureaucracy. So the principle of automatic inheritance, which is linked to monarchy, was not adopted. Now another important factor when considering these hypothetical clashes between empires, of course, is the weapons and armour. So talking about weapons and armour of ancient China, the first thing to consider is what era we are talking about. And clearly if we look at early types of Chinese armour, when we can find rawhide, we can find even shell armour. But what we are interested in is Han dynasty armour and in a way we will also be looking at Qin dynasty armour. Because when talking about Western Han, bronze would have been the most common metal. But as we reach Eastern Han, we already see the spread of iron. Now that is very important because the Romans also had mastered iron. But what kind of armour were the Han and Qin dynasty warriors using? Well, we are considering a flexible armour, made of small overlapping rectangles of leather or metal, or even a mixture of the two, held together using leather thongs, hemp, cords or rivets, made into a form of a tunic. We can see this in the terracotta warriors. This is lamella armour. In the case of leather, it would have been hardened, tanned and lacquered leather. When we look at the terracotta warriors to find information about this sort of armour, we see that the warriors display seven different types of armoured tunics, some with extended flaps to protect the groin, and again, rectangles made of bronze or even iron could be used. So in terms of mechanical properties, Chinese body armour was extremely efficient. Armour quality, and in the majority of cases I'm going to say that Chinese lamella armour would have been definitely superior to Roman scale armour, but probably on pair with Roman segmentata, and depending on the sort of weapons that were used, segmentata would have been even better. Mail is also a very practical and very effective kind of armour, and although the Chinese knew about it, it never really became particularly popular until later time. But what about shields? Did the Chinese use shields? The answer is absolutely. We know shields were in use during the Shang period or even before. 
The early ones were particularly large, but as body armor becomes more efficient, they start scaling down. They were based on a wooden frame and combined with bronze or iron plates and leather. Early or more rudimental versions would have been made of wicker, interlaced bamboo or reeds, but definitely these would have been immediately discarded and not used against the advanced Romans. I can instead imagine a reorganization of the quality of shields as the effectiveness of Roman shields or scuta would have been evident. The Chinese infantry shield was held on one hand and the remaining tomb suggests they had an approximate rectangle shape, possibly curved slightly outward in the center. But there is one thing that the Chinese would have definitely an advantage and it was the wide use of crossbows. Yes, crossbows had been invented already crossbow was introduced in Chinese warfare during the Warring State period, so we're talking about 481 to 222 BC. During the Han period it was already developed into a more powerful and accurate weapon. It had light versions and heavy versions, and even versions that could be mounted into a rotating movable base becoming actual artillery. It was a major factor in the success of the Chinese against other foreign armies in establishing dominance of the Han. The Chinese crossbow, with its horizontal bow and short wooden stock, fired single or multiple arrows. Now, could these arrows have enough power to penetrate Roman armour? Difficult to say, and we do know that the Romans had specific tactics against missile weapons, namely the Testudo. Okay, so we are in the topic of Chinese weapons. Now, this is a massive topic and it does deserve its dedicated video. Now, as you can see, I have already mentioned the crossbow, which in Chinese is pronounced Nu, because I thought that there was a very interesting piece of information. And clearly, I cannot speak about Chinese without mentioning at least the famous Dao or single-edged sword. And a specific kind of sword that I'd like you to draw your attention to, a standard sidearm of infantry and cavalry the ring head sword, Huan Shou Dao, an ancestor of the Da Dao and possibly even the Katana. Even if it just focused on Han Dynasty weapons alone, it would take a huge amount of time to describe each single possible weapon. I'd like to at least mention pole weapons. Why? Because we are in the context of war and always, whenever we talk about battlefield, pole weapons reign. There were quite a lot of different kinds of pole weapons and each kind had its own variants in Chinese history. But two, I think, are very, very important to mention. One is the Qiang, the spear, called also the king of weapons. Another form of pole weapon is the Ji, which, yes, some people call it halberd, and it does remind of European halberds, but I think it's probably closer to a Bec du Corbin, 2.8 meters long, so quite long. Some of these Chinese pole weapons, in fact, considering the length, are probably closer to pikes or Greek sarisa than they are to spears. Okay, so now that we understand thoroughly the difference between a Chinese emperor and a Roman emperor, we're going to shift our focus towards something that occurred around 165 AD. We are talking about a viral phenomenon called the Antonine Plague. Also known as the Plague of Galen, the Antonine Plague was an ancient pandemic that affected Asia Minor, Egypt, Greece and Italy. This unknown disease was brought back to Rome by soldiers stationed in Mesopotamia in about 165 AD. Unknowingly, they had brought back a disease that would end up killing 5 million people and decimate the Roman army. Now, we can't be 100% sure, but it is thought to have been smallpox. Smallpox was caused by infection with the variola virus, which belongs to the genome Orthopox virus, the family Poxviridae and the subfamily Cordopoxvirinae. Variola appears as a brick-shaped virus, measuring approximately 302 to 350 nanometers, with a single linear double-stranded DNA genome. The structure we see inside the virion is the viral core, which contains the viral DNA. In order to replicate, pox viruses produced an array of specialized proteins not produced by any other DNA virus. Transmission occurred through inhalation of airborne variola virus. It was transmitted from one person to another primarily through prolonged face-to-face -face contact with an infected person. 
usually within a distance of 1.8 meters or 6 feet, but could also be spread through direct contact with infected or contaminated objects, such as for example bedding or clothing. The virus had no asymptomatic carrier state. Okay, so big thanks to Dr. Ra for explaining to us what the uh, smallpox virus was, and most likely that was indeed the so-called Antonine Plague. So having considered this, how could this affect an actual uh, potential clash between these two empires? Well, if the clash happened during the times of this plague, then a lot of things could have happened. I mean, the Romans could have literally used a biological warfare against their opponent, and I think that that could have been devastating for China. Um, the idea of using your own sick or the, the dead contaminated bodies was done. It's not like the ancient population didn't use biological warfare. It perhaps wasn't as sophisticated as modern biological warfare, but it did exist. We know the Mongols used it. We know Genoese traders were, in fact, infected by uh, contact with Mongolian uh, infected dead bodies that were thrown literally during a siege. And the Genoese, as they were fleeing away, the damage was already done, and they brought back to Europe, in fact, to Sicily, uh, the uh, uh, Yersinia pestis bacterium, better known as the Black Death. So that was also most likely the um, result of biological warfare. And biological warfare, would the Romans have used it? I'm gonna say yes, because when the Romans were facing a tenacious opponent, and the Chinese Han would have been a tenacious opponent, no, for sure. They took every possible advantage they could find. So what would the Chinese have done? Well, I think if the Han Empire knew that something like that was happening, it would have found countermeasurements. And so again, it would have become maybe very much of a siege warfare. They probably wouldn't have fought the Romans in noble battlefield anyways. Perhaps they would have just waited for the Roman army to be decimated. And if that were the case, then everything would have to do with siege equipment, siege machinery, and of course the amount of time Chinese fortified cities of the time sustain themselves, because again it is a matter of logistics, again it is a matter of food. Um, can they sustain themselves for enough time to wait for the Romans to just give up on sieging because everybody's dying out of the genome, out of the virus, or could the Romans break through uh, the capital defences, because remember the capital is west, so it's not like they need to go through the entirety of China to reach the neuralgic centre where the emperor was. So did the Romans have enough siege equipment and uh, expertise to be able to break through the walls of the capital Chang'an and spread the disease and let the disease take its tolls. Well, this is very difficult to consider, but one thing is for sure. If this clash happened after 165, then the face of this warfare wouldn't have been anything but conventional in my opinion. Whereas if the clash happened before the Antonine Plague, then most likely we would have seen conventional warfare and, uh, and I'm gonna say not asymmetric warfare because they were very similar in power, equipment and progress. So probably symmetric warfare, open field warfare. So since this is such a close clash of powerful civilizations, rather than just choosing one as the victor, I'm going to consider both scenarios. What would have happened if the Romans had won, and what would have happened if the Han had won? Well, what did the Romans do? Much would depend on how much of a trouble the Chinese would be. We know that if people surrendered without too much trouble, their province would be brought into the empire. So the Chinese empire would then become officially part of the Roman empire. The conquered people would keep their religion, their culture, their language, but of course they would still be under the heavy influence of the Roman way of life and Latin would definitely become a second language in the Chinese Empire, possibly influencing also the development of future versions of Chinese depending on how long the Romans were to manage to stay in those territories and maintain dominance. The main thing is that if they obeyed Roman law and paid Roman taxes, most likely the Chinese would continue to prosper. Think of the influence the Romans had on the land of Romania, which got its name by copying Roman ways. But what would have happened if the Chinese had lost after a very long campaign, excruciating and costly war against the Romans? Well, we know that the Romans did not 
use half measures. I mean, just look at what Julius Caesar did in Gaul after beating the Gallic tribes that were revolting in order to avoid them from even considering the idea of revolting again against the power of Rome. He had every male suitable able to take up arms to have his right hand removed, cut. We're talking about mass mutilations, selling survivors into slavery. The Romans had no problems doing horrible things, but why would they need to do such a thing? Well, unfortunately, in order to retain control over very difficult areas of the empire, at that time, they chose to use the brutal ways. They were experienced at this. All the way from their clash against Carthage, they did not hesitate to use violence and terror. So what about the Chinese? Well, if the Chinese had managed to conquer and completely defeat the Romans, then they would definitely start expanding. Possibly one of the reasons why they did not expand that much on expeditions via the Silk Road, it was because it was too costly to conquer and colonize, and also Central Asia is not as suitable for agriculture as other areas, and certainly not for rice padded agriculture. But if they could lay their hands on the Mediterranean, I am going to say they definitely would. Trying to assimilate the local culture, what we know now as Europe, would probably have a completely different face. Chinese pottery, art and culture being exported all the way through the through what used to be the Roman territory. And who knows, this could have also paved the way for a future Mongolian invasion that this time would have not stopped. But much of this, of course, is pure speculation. All right, Nova Ones, well, I hope that you liked this episode of the VS series. There are quite a lot of other videos, as I said, on this channel about Roman legions versus loads of things, to be honest, and many more to come. So if you did like this, please remember, thumbs up, share it with your friends. And if you're not yet a member of this community, become a Noble One, subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron. And remember, the Metatron has spread its wings. Valete!